Well, good morning, everybody. It's um, so good to be here this morning and to see the um, church so nicely filled. Where's everybody coming from? Fantastic. Wish it could be like that every week. Lovely. Uh, thank you uh, this morning for the worship team for what you've done. Thank you, uh, Denise, for the story. And thank you so much, Kristen, for that special item. And uh, it was only on Thursday, I think, I rang Tristan and I rang Denise if they would do a, something in their service this morning. And thank you, thank you for stepping up to the plate. And I do appreciate it very much. Um, I didn't expect to be here today, but I'm here, so I do trust that what I've got prepared for you will be of interest to you and will be beneficial in your Christian walk. And uh, just a little bit of trivia in my life, it's um, this month is 60 years since I um, had a go at doing my first sermon. And uh, hopefully today will be a better effort than what that one was way back there in 1959 when I was a teenager in a little Glen Innes church up there in um, New England. Um, Julie, you may have been there, I'm not sure. You probably can't remember because... Um, you were only a toddler then, I think, a little bit older. <laughs> Good on you. But I still remember the, um, the, um, the pastor came to me and he said, look, I'm going away for a holiday. Would you, could you do a sermon? And uh, he even gave me the text, and I remember the text. The text was, uh, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And uh, I'm not sure if I did that text justice, but... Uh, I had a go, and that's the main thing, to have a go. It's, it's an all-important thing, isn't it? And, um, you know, I suppose uh, one of the hard things when you're, when you're preparing a sermon is to actually um, work out what you are going to um, talk about. And um, the sermon I'm, I've prepared today uh, was, uh, I was prompted uh, by an ad on the back of a record that came out some time ago. In quite bold lettering, it says, uh, make amazing things happen. And uh, lo and behold, on that very, almost the same minute I picked that up to read it on the Sabbath afternoon when I got home, I, um, Sue had been shopping and she'd picked up, some, uh, picked up a, uh, a little notepad. And uh, on the front of that notepad, it had these words. Can everybody read that? It says, make it happen. Make it happen. And uh, that very same evening, uh, I was watching the television and an Officeworks ad came on and the Officeworks ad said, we can make great things happen for you. So I thought, well, hang on. Um, make amazing things happen. That would be a good title for a sermon. So that's what I've tried to build it on this morning. And my initial thought was, how do we make amazing, amazing things happen? And I'm sure each one of us here this morning would like uh, amazing things to happen, but how do we make things happen? Well, I've put together a raft of stories this morning on ordinary people who have done extraordinary things and have made amazing things happen. But before we start, let us just bow our head uh, in a word of prayer and ask God's blessing upon the time that we spend together this morning. Our Heavenly Father, this is your day. This is your house. We come today as your family. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come, remembering that we are here on our own choosing. No one has forced us to come. We acknowledge that you are our great provider. Today we are breathing your air. Today, Lord, we have already basked in your sunshine. We've already been drinking your water. Today, some of us have walked on your grass with bare feet. We have felt the breath of your breeze. You have provided it all for free. Thank you, Lord. And today we are going to look at the lives of a few people who made amazing things happen. Help us to be inspired by these stories of ordinary people who achieved extraordinary things. Lord, help us to enjoy our worship and our fellowship today, I pray. Amen. Now, I'd just like to... Um, first story I'd like to share with you 
is a story uh, about of um, way back in the 1600s, and it's the story of four boys. Now I'm going to tell you the name of the four boys, and I want you to um, tell me which country you think these boys come from. Okay. Uh, the first boy was Luciano, and he was 14 years of age. Uh, his mate was Andre, and he was 15 years of age. Giovanni was 15 years of age. And then there was little Antonio, and he was just 11 years of age. And these boys hung out in a group. They, they were friends, and they hung out together and did, did, did lots of things. So what country do you think they came from? That's right, Italy, of course. And all these boys lived in a city called Cremona. And uh, now Sue and I have actually been to Cremona. Uh, we went through Cremona and stayed off there one afternoon on, on our a drive from Nice down to Venice. And it's a lovely old city, not a big city, but about 75,000 people live in Cremona. And each year, for as long as anyone can remember, Cremona has always held a song festival. And each year the town would set aside a week when people would go and they would busk in the streets. Almost like they are doing at Tamworth for the Country Music Festival, they're going and they're, and they're busking. And there were buskers everywhere, music everywhere. And so the four boys banded together and they decided that they would try their hand at a bit of busking. And uh, yes, they could sing and they knew a lot of songs. And that is except little Antonio. Now, Antonio had a problem. He had a very, very squeaky, high-pitched voice, and he couldn't hold a note. So that presented a bit of a problem to the other boys who made up the part of the quartet. So the other three boys decided that they would, um, that Antonio could be part of the quartet, but instead of singing, he could only mime the words, because they didn't want anybody to know how bad he was, so he was, he was allowed to join the quartet, but he could only mime. And so they uh, spent the whole week busking. They did really well. A lot of people tossed money into their hats, and on the last day of the festival, a very important man came by and placed four gold coins into each of their hands. Wow, said little Antonio, who is that man? Who is he? The other boys said, that is Nicola Amati, the most famous violin maker in all of Italy. He's very rich, and he lives down by the river in a big, big house. Now, Antonio couldn't sing, but Antonio was a great whittler, and uh, I think uh, most men here in our congregation today could remember the days when you had a pocket knife in your pocket and you'd go and cut off a stick or, and, you, and you'd whittle away and you'd make all sorts of things. Uh, Antonio was a great, great whittler. And he just loved to take out his pocket knife and whittle sticks and shape all sorts of things. He would make all sorts of things for his mother. She would ask him to make a whole raft of things for the kitchen and he could whittle it with a pocket knife and a stick. But at 11 years of age, after having uh, seen the the riches of Mr. Amati, Antonio decided that he would like to make violins like Mr. Amati. And when he told his friends that uh, he would like to make violins, they said, you couldn't make violins, you can only whittle sticks. Forget it, you're too little, you're too young. Mr. Amati wouldn't give you a job. But Antonio persisted. He was a small boy. He was also a shy boy, and he was very timid, and he was actually scared of grown-up people. One by one, he went to his friends and asked if they would go and ask Mr. Amati if he could have a job with him. And one by one, they said, no, no way. If you want to get a job from Mr. Amati, you will have to go and ask him yourself. We can't do it for you, only you can do that. So when he's uh, turned over his 12th birthday, after a lot of um, deliberation, he plucked up enough courage and he said to himself, I will go and ask Mr. Amati 
for a job, and he did. And he showed Mr. Amati how he could whittle, and he showed him some things which he had made, like a wooden spoon. He could make things like that out of a pocket knife and a bit of wood, he used to make those for his mum. Well, Mr. Amati was quite impressed by his persistence, and he gave him a job. It wasn't a job of, uh, of making violins, but it was a job cleaning, sweeping, doing all the odd, job, odd jobs around the violin factory. But after a couple of years, um, Antonio began, to make, uh, began himself to make violins. He made them slightly different. He made them slightly longer. He made them slightly thinner. He used different varnish on the timber. And when Mr. Amati died, Antonio became the most famous violiner, violin maker in all of Italy. Now, who am I talking about? Okay, that's right, Antonio Stradivari. And in his lifetime, he made 1,200 violins between 1668 and 1728, but unfortunately today only about 600 of these violins still remain. Now, I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Um, would you rather have this Ferrari? It's valued at 450 grand. Be nice, wouldn't it, to pot around Alsonville, do your shopping? A bit of stuff in the boot? 450 grand for a Ferrari? Would you rather have that Ferrari or would you like to uh, have a Strad? Now, I happen to have a Strad this morning, okay? Because if I look here in the, uh, what they call the F fret, if I look in here, you know what it says in there? It says Antonio Stradivari, 1668 Cremona. So there, you didn't know I had that, did you? Eh? A Strad, only joking. <laughs> I look in there and I, and then I see Skylark, Canton, China. Who would like to guess what the most money anyone has ever paid for a Strad? Who'd like to guess? Do you think you could buy a couple of Ferraris with the, uh, what you'd get for a Strad? Okay. Well, I can tell you, you would buy 100 Ferraris at 450 grand each with the uh, Viola that was made by Antonio Stradivari in uh, 2000 and, uh, sorry, in um, 1668, at auction in 2016, it bought $45 million. So that was enough to um, buy yourself 100 of those, okay? Amazing, isn't it? You know, way back there in um, 1666, Antonio Stradivari, he had no way of knowing that in, in the year 2009, Andre Roux would pay $12 million for one of his violins. And in 2016, as we have said, one of his violas sold for $45 million. But all through his life, he did know, at 12 years of age, he had enough courage to go down to Mr. Armati's mansion and knock on the door and ask him for a job. You see, because no one else could do it for him. Now, I'm not sure if we have the sermon title up on the board. Do we have it on the board? Um, because, no, we don't, okay, right. Okay, so um, look, if you've got a pen and paper uh, it would be of interest to jot down this sermon title because it's, a, it's an interesting one. And it's what I call the ten, ten tiny words of power. Paul, do you want to come and sit up a bit closer? You're struggling to hear. Do you want to sit up a little bit closer? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the sermon title is, if it, if, it's ten tiny words of power. And these are the ten tiny words. Remember this. If it is to be, 
It is up to me. So they're ten little two-letter words, and, and they're what we call the ten tiny words of power. Uh, and I suppose, as a beginning, I would like to talk about um, discipleship as a way of introducing what I want to talk about. Um, you know, in Scripture, Scripture says quite plainly, if we love God, then we are his disciples. John 13, 35 has this to say, if we love one another, then we are his disciples indeed. And I suppose the question that we could ask is, what then is a disciple? And uh, I went to the dictionary to find out what a disciple is, and the dictionary told me these four or five different things. First one is, uh, the definition of a disciple is one, one who believes. Uh, the second meaning was one who is a committed follower. The third definition of one who is a doer. And the fourth one probably sums it up better than any of those. It says one who moves to promote the teachings of the cause in which he or she believes. So that means when we accept Jesus, when we become followers, we become in a very real sense disciples just as they did back there in the time of Christ. But you know with acceptance, also comes responsibility. The responsibility is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 24 and verse 14. And the good news of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the whole world for a witness unto all nations, kindred, tongues and people, and then shall the end come. So in that verse of Matthew 24, 14, we are, giving, we are given a commission and our commission is simply this. We are to preach the word, we are to teach the word, above all we are to live the word and we are to promote the gospel. How can it happen? That's the question, how can it happen? It will only happen as we believe, as we take initiative and are motivated by a desire to tell others about Christ and what he has done and then things will begin to happen. Remember, one of the definitions of a disciple was one who moves to promote the teachings of the cause in which he or she believes. We have to make the moves. The Holy Spirit provides the insight and the inclination that we have to be the instruments or the doers. If we want things to happen, we have to put the wheels in motion. I suppose it's probably a little bit like driving a car. We know the mechanics, we can understand the manufacturer's handbook, we can know how much the power the motor has, whether it's a V8 or a turbo or whatever. We can know how to steer, we know how the brakes work, we know how the indicators work, but until we fire up the motor, pull the car into gear and put our foot on the accelerator, until we do all this, well, I'm telling you, nothing will happen. We'll just sit there and we'll go nowhere. But when initiative and a strong desire to do God's work come together, then things will begin to happen. If it is to be, it is up to me. What these tiny words, these ten tiny words of power are saying, if you want things to happen, you have to make it happen. You know, in this world, there are three types of people. There are the type of people who make things happen. There are the types of people who sit back in comfort and watch things happen. And then there are those who say, oh my goodness, what happened? And uh, I mean, that categorizes the three type of people that exist in the world. I'd like to tell you a story about Tom. Now Tom, I would say, began his life in the very worst possible way. He was born back in 1938, and when he was four years old, just four years of age, his dad died. And uh, when he was six years old, he and his older brother were put into an orphanage because his mother could no longer care for them. So Tom, uh, with his brother, spent the next 10 years 
in and out of orphanages, sometimes going to school, sometimes not. More often than not, he would stay at home and not go to school. But in his early years, and this is an important part of the story, in his early years at a Catholic orphanage, he developed a love of spiritual things. God became his friend, his very, very dearest friend. Not in a theological sense, as we would sometimes put it, but rather someone whom he could talk to on the many occasions when he needed somebody to confide in when he was lonely and when he was on his own. In his later teens, Tom was just drifting, no plans, no goals, no money, no regular income. He became envious of people who had money. How he wished he could drive a flash car. How he wished he could own a Mercedes Benz or have a nice house or even have enough money to go on a holiday. He wanted to do all these things but he was powerless to do anything about it. He had no resources. Years before, in the Catholic orphanage, Becky, the lady in charge of the kitchen, uh, took a liking to Tom and took, her, took him under her wing. And she taught him how to uh, fashion and how to make a good pizza. And um, Tom took to fiddling with dough very, very quickly. He loved fiddling with dough. He loved getting the dough and kneading it and tossing it round and making shapes and everything else. And he practised and practised and practised until he could make a pizza faster than anybody else that he, could, that he ever knew. Around 1960, around the year 1960, he took a temporary job delivering parcels. One of his clients ran, ran a big printing business. And on the door of the um, client's office, were these, t uh, these, tiny, th these words. If it is to be, it is up to me. That's it, Tom realised. I must go and ask the CEO what these words mean. So he knocked gently on the door and said, excuse me, sir, but uh, those words on your door, what do they mean? And uh, the man said, Tom, if you want things to happen, you have to make the moves. You have to make it happen. So Tom walked out of that office, realising that his life at, to that point of time had amounted to nothing and that he would have to do something if he wanted to move on with life. And so he immediately thought the only thing he was good at in all the years he'd spent was he was good at making pizzas. And so in 1962, with borrowed money, he and his brother, they bought a run-down pizza business. Now, it went very poorly for the first 12 months, and after 12 months, the brother said, I'm out of here, and uh, you can buy my half the business. Well, Tom didn't have any money, but he had an old beat-up 1957 Beetle, Volkswagen Beetle, and he gave that to his brother as half share of the business. Well, the rest is history. The business grew and grew. Tom started a venture that if he couldn't, make and uh, a pizza in 15 minutes, you got the pizza free. That was, his, that was his slogan. 15 minutes or the pizza's free. Tom Monaghan became a billionaire. He, uh, the first little shop he operated was Dominique and he renamed it Domino's Pizzas. And uh, you know, last count and I looked on the internet, there are 10,000 Domino pizza shops around the world in 70 different countries. And, now, and Tom, uh, now at 81 years of age, works full time at building school in th uh, schools in third world countries. He is sharing his enormous wealth with kids all around the globe. It all started way back there in 1960 when Tom realised if he wanted things to happen, he alone could make it happen. The words, if it is to be, it is up to me, have been forever etched on Tom's mind. That was the catalyst that got him going. Had Tom not ever cited these words, his life may never have amounted to anything. So next time you buy a Domino pizza, remember the story of Tom Monaghan. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, 
If I was to um, uh, tell you the name of this couple, Basil and Sue Rice, that would mean nothing to anybody sitting here this morning, I'm sure. Uh, Basil was a solicitor in Armidale in New England. He also owned a farm near our, ta our, town, our hometown in Varel. And uh, he had a farm about five k's from where we had our farm. And uh, the Rices had a large family. They had eight kids. They had seven boys, and the youngest one to come along was a little girl named Gemma. And they were a very strong Catholic family. And uh, on their property, they even built a small chapel. And uh, from a young age, Gemma wanted to make amazing things happen. Now, after finishing school, she went to school in Inverell, and uh, she used to be in swimming club with our daughter, Alison, and uh, they used to train together. She went off and she studied at, at, the, at the university in Melbourne. She graduated with a couple of degrees. One of those degrees included a, 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 a degree in teaching. And at the age of 22, she packed up her bags and went to live in Uganda. She got a job teaching there in Uganda. She wasn't there very long when she saw the need, the dire need to educate poor children. Those children who had no chance in life to escape the dire poverty that they were living in. And she lobbied the Ugandan government without success for, for funds to start a school. Around about that time, while she was teaching there, she met a 27-year-old fellow from Tanzania. And in a very short time, in a matter of few, quite a few months or less than a year, they got married. Uh, his name was Richard. He became her husband. And then they moved across to Tanzania to set up home. And uh, when they set up home there, Gemma was confronted once again with the same problem. Poor kids everywhere and no schools for them. Now, as luck happened, Richard's dad was a tribes person and uh, he owned a little bit of land and he gave uh, Gemma and Richard a couple of acres of land. And uh, the uttermost thing in Gemma's mind was to, she dearly wanted to start a school. And once again, she lobbied, lobbied the Tanzanian government, but this time without any success at all. But after several attempts and much prayer and to and froing, she said to her husband, Richard, one evening, if I want this to happen, then we're going to have to make it happen. If it is to be, it is up to me. And so she flew out to Australia, back to Australia in the, in the end of the year holidays, and she started fundraising. And the first port of, port of call was the Rotary Club in Gaira, just not far from Armidale. And uh, she told them her vision and what she wanted to do. And um, so, as a result of that, 13 of the local lads up there decided that they would go to Africa and on that block of land they would put up the very first school, um, school building, school room. And uh, so that's what they did. They, they built this little school room. And in 2003, uh, Gemma commenced her school with three students. Can you believe that? Three students, she began the school. Now, in 2019, she has a boarding school there of 2,300 students, 350, 350 full-time staff. She has never, ever received any government money, only sponsors and donations. Every year, millions of dollars pour into her school from all over the world. Her school, St Jude's, is the most famous school in Tanzania. And kids who go to her school can only go if they commit to go on to university or to some other form of higher education. And her students over the years have gone on to achieve amazing things. And the country has been blessed by her having the courage and the faith and the drive and the vision to make it happen. And I suppose what I'm trying to say and the emphasis I'm trying to get to you this morning is the emphasis here is on you and on me. No one else can do it for us. And it does remind me of a story 
in, in the Old Testament book of Joshua. And it's found in, in the book of uh, Joshua chapter 3. And uh, I'd like to begin in verse 3, chapter 3 of verse 3. And it's talking here about Joshua and the tribe of Israel when they were camped at the river Jordan. And it says, very early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia and they arrived at the river Jordan where they camped for three days before attempting the crossing. Now, um, two years ago, a little bit less, Sue and I walked along that very stretch of river on the river Jordan um, where they crossed uh, opposite Jericho and um, it was a very, very sobering thing to walk on that ground where, where I knew from previous years reading the story that Joshua and the children of Israel had actually walked. And then in verse 6, uh, Joshua instructs the priests who are travelling with them, he said, lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. And in verse 13, Joshua then goes on to instruct the people. He said, the priests will be carrying the Ark of the Lord. Now the important part is, when their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream. Now, those people who are probably older here and have seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, will never forget the scene when Israel crossed the Red Sea. Moses is standing on the shore with his shepherd's staff in hand, holding it over the water. The waters bang up on both sides as a path, a dry strip of land between the walls of water begins to form. The tribes of Israel cross the dry seabed in safety. It was a very moving moment. God is good. And Israel celebrated his goodness and greatness with songs of victory. But now the story brings us to another time in history. It's 40 years later. A new generation of Israel, Israel, Israelites, none of whom had ever lived in Egypt except Caleb and Joshua, are now camped near the River Jordan. And they have been there for three, day, for three days, and now it is time to go across. Normally the Jordan at this spot is 33 metres across, just two cricket pitches in width, and you could throw a stone across it. But now it's passed over, over time, and it's early spring, and the snows of the mountains of Lebanon have thawed. Now the Jordan is in full flood. The dark swirling waters have covered the lower banks. And so the Ark of the Covenant, as we read in um, verse 13, is, is uh, carried by the priests. It leads the way. Joshua has commanded, when you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, follow them. Since you have never travelled this way before, they will guide you. But keep a clear distance between you and the Ark. And just to make this a little bit more interesting this morning, uh, I want uh, you, each one of you sitting here this morning, to become one of the priests that are carrying the ark. Just in front of you, the flooded waters of Jordan are rushing past at a rapid rate. Joshua has told you, just keep walking, don't stop. Just keep going. When your feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off. You've never experienced, you've never experienced the crossing of the Red Sea so you don't have that experience to encourage you. Sure, you have heard stories about what happened there, but their, their version of what happened and what you are about to experience seem absolute worlds apart. You are the new generation. You were born in Sinai, in the Sinai Desert. You've never seen this much water in your life. And now you have to walk into it, carrying the ark. This is a totally new experience for you. Joshua, who experienced the, flood, the exodus and the opening of the Red Sea, is asking you to step into a flooded river, carrying the ark on poles on your shoulders. The ark is covered with gold. And even if your experience with water isn't extensive, you know one thing for sure, gold doesn't float. So what choice do you have? It's up to you to lead the tribes forward into the flooded river remembering that nothing will happen, nothing at all will happen until you move. The people behind you are becoming restless. They're bunching up. There's a lot of shouting and a lot of yelling going on. 
but you have to move forward. God has promised to dry up the river, but it will not happen until your feet are in the water. So you move forward and your feet get wet. And lo and behold, nothing happens. Now you really, really do look foolish. You've made your move and two million people behind you are waiting for the dry land to appear and nothing happens. You would assume that if God promised to do something like providing a dry path through the flood water so that you can all get across to the promised land, it, will, it would all happen immediately. But you know, God did what he had promised immediately. He did it 26 kilometers upstream at a place called Adam. Now, I've flown over Adam probably about, I don't know, guessing five or six times. And um, always of a night time, I've flown over Adam, coming in from Lebanon, uh, down from Switzerland and other countries we've been visiting on our trips over there. And uh, the town of Adam always comes up on the monitor when, you, when you're down in that part of the Middle East. And uh, I look out the window and I can see the lights of Adam from the, from the plane. And uh, so the water began piling up at a place called Adam. And the water below that point flowed to the, onto the Dead Sea until the riverbed was completely dry. So that's why you and the other priests had to wait. You had to wait until 26 kilometers of flood water flowed past. It was like after you pull the plug out of the bathtub. You have to, have to wait until the bath water runs out of the plug hole before you can stand on the bottom of the bath. Remember what happened when you were standing on the bank of, uh, before you moved? Absolute nothing. Nothing happened at all. Nothing happened until you stepped into the water. And it's always true, isn't it? Whether it's all at the bank of the Jordan or here in Alstonville, or wherever we are, nothing will happen until we move. Nothing will happen until we get our feet wet. The moment we quit holding back, God will give us power. He will open the, right, he will open the doors, the right people will come, and the ways and the means will be provided. Opportunities will present themselves for you to share your testimony about Jesus, but nothing will happen, nothing at all will happen until you make the moves. In the book of First Chronicles, chapter 28, and verses 10 and 20, King David tells his son Solomon, and he has this to say, the Lord has chosen you to build a temple as his sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Be strong and courageous and do the work. Don't be afraid or discouraged by the size of the task, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will see to it that all the work related to the temple of the Lord is finished correctly, but nothing will happen, nothing will happen, Solomon, until you make the moves. You know, in the book Testimonies, volume 2, page 245, uh, Ellen White has this to say, to every man and woman, God gives the ability to do his work. And it should be their ambition to do this work well to the best of their ability. According to their capabilities, the interest expected will be in proportion to the amount entrusted. And so remember, the Holy Spirit provides the prompting. Scripture gives us the blueprint. God provides the power, but the get up and go must come from us. We must be willing to dip our feet in the water and trust the outcomes to God. We must be willing to have a go, to make things happen. Can we make amazing things happen? With God's help, yes, we can. Others have done it. You and I can do it too. But we must be first of all willing to have a go. If we try and fail, doesn't matter. 10 out of 10 for having a go. I'd rather have tried and failed than never have tried at all. Remember as disciples, we have a work to do. We have a message to share. 
God has, given, has placed on us a responsibility to other people. But remember, nothing will happen until we make the moves. Remember the ten tiny words of power. If it is to be, it is up to me. May God bless us as we put these words into practice. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening this morning. I hope you got something from it. Let's just bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning, Lord, for our time that we've spent together. Thank you, Lord, for the little insight into people's lives who have achieved great things. We looked at the life of Antonio Stradivari. He had a great gift to create violins, and for centuries his instruments have brought great joy to myriads of people. But it only happened because as a young boy, he had the courage to make things happen. Nobody else could do it for him. And then we looked at Tom Monaghan. He was struggling and without direction. He turned his life around and turned failure into success by the realisation that if he wanted something to happen, then he had to make it happen. And now, because of his great wealth, thousands of kids enjoy the blessing of a good education. We looked at little Gemma Rice from Inverell. At a young age, she caught the vision to make things happen. And now thousands of kids in Tanzania enjoy the benefits of a good education. Because back in 2003, she uttered these words, if it is to be, it is up to me. And at the River Jordan, on the way to the Promised Land, the priests carrying the ark were able to stop the flow of water by claiming the promise and dipping their toes into the water. But all these stories, Lord, and thousands of others, similar stories, are only a prelude to the greatest story of all. When the plan of salvation was formulated in heaven before the fall of man, Jesus agreed to pay the ultimate price by offering himself as the sacrifice for all mankind. <coughs> only he could do it. Nobody else could do it for him. And so it is with us. If we want things to happen, we have to launch out in faith and have a go. We all, each one, have a job to do. We ask for strength and vision and commitment and ability to make things happen for you. Amen.